Hi, welcome back to Real Seekers. I, I'm your host, Dale the Real Seeker. And today I have a, a real special treat that I'm uh, personally really excited about uh, having. I have a special guest, um, Dr. David Instone Brewer. Uh, welcome to the show, David. Hi, it's great to be with you. Excellent. Thank you. And um, today we're going to be speaking. So um, David is a um, rabbinic scholar and a New Testament scholar. Um, I'll, I'll let him introduce himself in a minute. But um, yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, the topic of Jesus and the New Testament in light of Judaism and, and what we know about uh, Judaism at the time Jesus lived and that sort of thing. And there, there are various topics we've arranged to, to discuss there. But yeah, before we get into the topic, uh, let me turn it straight to you, David, and, and give us sort of a introduction as to who you are. Um, if you don't mind, maybe give us a bit about your, your own faith journey there as well. Yeah, I'm, um, I started off wanting to be uh, a medic, a psychiatrist, mm -hmm. and uh, the Lord pulled me gently but firmly off in other directions and uh, led me to the ministry instead. And uh, then um, I wandered off into academia. Uh, that is, uh, I was pulled that way. I wasn't uh, seeking it. But uh, the Baptist Union in the UK uh, seconded me as a minister in the academic world. So I'm, it's, they, they reckoned that uh, they needed ministers who were actually active in research. So I happily went off to do that. Uh, my interest in um, no, I think I ought to step back because, uh, of course, I became a Christian at some point. And that was when I was a child, when I was about 12, I think. And uh, that that was uh, a very low point in my life. And I was feeling a bit suicidal, I think. And uh, completely friendless and turning to Jesus. I found I had a friend. It was strange not to be lonely anymore. That was a very, very precious experience. Wow. Wow. I did. Yes. Yeah, so some definitely some some things in there that I wasn't aware of there so interesting so um did you after becoming um a Christian at the age of 12 did, did you ever encounter any doubts that that came up afterwards or once you once you converted that that was it like you were sort of solid uh no I was a very uh, intellectual child I was always reading and questioning and uh, anything that I heard from the pulpit I questioned I <laughs> So it was, must have been very, very hard for the, the poor ministers who preached to me. Mm -hmm. So I was forever saying, ah, but how do you know that? And and I spent a lot of time in uh, the public libraries, uh, you know, searching out a historical basis for for my faith and uh, seeing whether it made sense or not, uh, because I was uh, absolutely, well, sceptical of everything, really. Yeah, you, uh, I think my pastor can relate to your old pastor there, because I, I certainly ask him a lot of <laughs> a lot of uh, hair pulling questions at times. So, um, excellent. All right, cool. So, so yeah, and, and um, currently now you're you're a rabbinic scholar and New Testament scholar, as I, as I mentioned there. So, yeah, I wanted to get your expertise um, related to Jesus and and you know the the New Testament in that light. So. The very first thing I, I want to ask you about here is uh, I do have some uh, atheists and skeptics that listen to my show that are Jesus mythicists. Um, believe it or not, that, that position is still around. Um, but um, yeah, g given your expertise there, I just wanted to, to ask you, what what is some of the Jewish evidence that's relevant to your background that might suggest that the historical Jesus did exist as a historical figure is there anything in the rabbinic literature that that could speak to that in your opinion or um yeah what's your take on that that question yeah in the jewish world it's uh, just a taken uh, just a given that uh, jesus was a historical person i, I remember um at times when i've been at uh, jewish conferences where i'm the only goy in the uh, audience and the coffee times and that they'd come to me and they say oh, oh it's so you're so, it's so wonderful that you're working in a new testament because there we got real historical documents but of course with our rabbinic stuff with our talmud and that we have to question everything but it's wonderful to have the new testament by which we can verify things in the talmud <laughs> and of course when i'm in uh, with christian scholars or uh, scholars of the new testament they say, oh, you know, we can't believe anything in the New Testament. But it's so great that you know the Talmud and you know the Mishnah and you can verify some of the things in our sources. <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah. And and do you, do you think personally that there are any um, 
specific sources that that could be used so you know for for example uh, outside of the rabbinic rabbinic literature people will point to josephus or or tacitus for example to to say there this is some evidence direct evidence that the historical jesus did in fact live do you think there's anything within the rabbinic literature itself that could be used in that way yes there's a ton of it um unfortunately christians didn't do themselves much good uh in in the uh 1500s when the Pope decided to uh, let the Talmud and the other Jewish writings be published so long as the censors had a good look at it first and suddenly the Jews had to excise all the bits about Jesus because they weren't very uh, complimentary. So the, the Talmuds that we have, uh, I think it's only the Munich Talmud uh, is, exists with some of the stuff about Jesus in it, but most of them have uh, completely uh, cut it out in order to get past the censors. But it still exists in the Toledosh Yeshu, the uh, generations of Jesus, uh, stories from the second, third century, and uh, with a basis uh, much earlier than that. Um, not celebrating Jesus, but uh, all sorts of scurrilous stories about Jesus. Okay, perfect. Um, and you mentioned one specific account, the Toledosh uh, Yeshu uh, text. And that yeah, it, it, Toledosh Yeshu is um, it's not quite a document. It's a collection that you can put together as a document from many sources. And uh, it uh, just tells lots of stories, scurrilous stories. You know, Jesus is now in hell um, in boiling feces or, or things that Jesus did in his lifetime, how he stole the pronunciation of the name of God and thereby did miracles. And he used to fly around the land uh, because he knew how to fly as a result of knowing how to pronounce God's name. Ridiculous things. But <laughs> The Jews were telling themselves these stories in order to explain how it was that Jesus was rightly known to have done miracles, and somehow they had to have an answer to this. Yeah, they had to they had to respond because they they knew the the historical facts weren't in in question um, on his existence. There, there is one tradition that uh, comes up a few times in Talmud about the trial of Jesus, and there there is a, a real historical core. Uh, the although the uh, there are accretions to that tradition, and you can take those away and see what's left there. And you see uh, the, um, what has it goes, something like uh, for 40 days before the Passover, the herald went and said uh, Jesus of Nazareth is uh, going to be tried for, um, oh, I can't remember the words now. But uh, it, you can look up my paper on it and uh, see what the charges were that were brought against Jesus. And it's uh, quite likely that that was a tr uh, charge sheet that was produced at Jesus' trial. It's uh, uh, It's got um, a lot of things which the Jews would not have wanted to say, but they have to say because it's part of the history they inherit. Uh, one one um, quick follow-up. Um, with with some of these, so I, I know that Christians, so, so I was reading, um, when I was preparing this question for you, I was looking at Josh McDowell's book, He Walked Among Us. And he, he kind of splits the, them up into reliable traditions versus unreliable traditions. And um, one of the factors that, that will come up is a, a lot of skeptics usually just dismiss the re rabbinic references to Jesus. Look, these are, are way too late. Like, it's not like Josephus or Tacitus where we can date it within a specific range. Um, and I know that was something that I, I think I overheard you in one of your lectures is saying, well, well not so fast. Maybe, maybe some of these... Uh, references are earlier than what we typically think. So did you want to maybe speak to what, what's the dating of some of these references to Jesus in the rabbinic literature? Well, like most of the stuff in rabbinic literature, it's um, it has been written down late, uh, but the, uh, the ideas are early. And it's always very difficult working out how early they are. Uh, with that um, reference to the trial of Jesus, there elements there which the Jews would not have wanted to say. Uh, one of the charges is that Jesus was uh, a sorcerer, uh, not a magician. A magician is someone who uh, does tricks and fools you into thinking that something magical has happened. But a sorcerer is someone who has real power. And uh, so his miracles are real. And he was charged at his death, according to this tradition, with sorcery, which meant that the Jews themselves recognized the miracles were real but they were trying to find some way in which they happened. So this isn't something that they would want to invent. It's something that they then have to deal with and they're dealing with from a, a very early time. 
And if if it hadn't been an early tradition they inherited, they would have just put in other words, you know, would have called it sorcery, uh, would have called it magic. But uh, no, they, they had to deal with the fact that their tradition said that he was charged with sorcery, real miracles. Yeah, interesting. All right, cool. Um, so so following up on that, so, OK, maybe the skeptic might say, OK, great, I'll, I'll give you that the rabbinic literature speaks to the question of the historical Jesus in general. But that's that's not necessarily the Jesus of Christianity as um you know, in terms of all of his doings and sayings and, and how he's represented in the New Testament literature. So uh, this is where I'm going to combine question three and four because they're kind of similar here. But um, yeah, OK, based on your background, then how, quote unquote, Jewish uh, is Jesus? Does he does Jesus, uh, the historical Jesus, as well as the Jesus represented in the New Testament literature, fit the milieu or the, the sits im Leben, as they say in German, uh, of the first century, second temple period of Judaism? My big work has been uh, looking at the rabbinic traditions and dating the ones that come from before the destruction of the temple. And I was surprised constantly to find that the details from that time mirror details in the Gospels. And sometimes those details help to uh, help us understand what the gospel tradition is talking about. The, the idea of an unforgivable sin. Uh, it's uh, a very ordinary idea in Judaism that there is such a thing as the unforgivable sin. It's basically blasphemy. Uh, but uh, the, what you find is that th they wouldn't have been surprised by that, but they were surprised to find that speaking bad of the Holy Spirit was unforgivable because that means the Holy Spirit is God. So Jesus there uh, he's the, the surprising thing is not that he's saying there's a sin that's unforgivable. The surprising thing is he's saying that the Holy Spirit is part of the Godhead. So suddenly a, a, a very difficult passage becomes a, a wow. That's part of the Christian message passage. Uh, and a, any other uh, examples that you wanted to talk about uh, in turn that reflect um, that show that, yeah, the, you know, what Jesus is teaching it does actually reflect uh, rabbinic uh notions at the time or or jewish notions at that time as well or yeah sometimes it's the very small things you know like the throwaway comments about tithing mint and um other herbs and they really were talking about that but they weren't talking about that in the second century they weren't talking about it in the first century bc as far as we know but they were definitely talking about it in the first century in the early first century they were very keen about separating the different herbs and making sure that each one of them is tithes. And he even says that if if the rabbis came across a field where herbs were growing together so they wouldn't get tithed properly, they'd just pull them out of the ground. And there's stories like that, which means that this was very uh, important to the Pharisees at that time, but not later. So it's you, you find in tiny little details like that, just a confirmation that the Gospels are set in a particular time and they make sense there. They don't make sense later if they had been invented. Gotcha. So, so yeah, de definitely you would, um, any um, sort of skeptics that, that sort of reflect the outdated 20th early 20th century notion like Boltmann and stuff that know that the New Testament literature as a whole, it, it's totally foreign to the Jewish context. It, it's a Gentile pagan thing that that's, we've moved beyond that in terms of the quest for historical quest for Jesus and that sort of thing, right? Yeah, I mean, e even little details like in Mark, where you have uh, um, wives uh, divorcing their husbands and people say, oh, well, that shows that Mark was writing for Gentiles because Jewish women didn't divorce their husbands. They did. They did in the first century. They did before 70. Uh, we even have a record of one woman who's still managing to almost do it in 120. But they did do it in the early days. They didn't do it later. Mm. The, the Gospels are very clearly set in a in a few decades of the first century. All right, uh, I'm gonna add um, an additional question. This wasn't in my in my list that I sent to you, but uh, you said you were flexible, so hopefully you don't mind me throwing it in. But um, yeah, it was, uh, this was something I, I reached out to you when I was researching with Gary Habermas, the, the evidence for the resurrection. And given your sort of, your background as a, again, a rabbinic scholar and, and that sort of thing, I'm wondering what, what would you make of the, the uh, first of all, you can give your take on the evidence for the resurrection in general and your take on that. But also, what about the claim that Jesus rose from the dead 
uh, within the Jewish context because, uh, you know, even N.T. Wright will say, well, well, there are some mutations. The notion of someone rising before the end of the world, um, someone someone might argue, well, this is totally un-Jewish. Uh, the notion of a crucified Messiah, um, does that really fit? Um, because they would be cursed on the tree. So, so yeah, do you want to maybe sort of focus, okay, well, what about Jesus' resurrection in the light of the a Second Temple period, um, late Second Temple period Judaism? Does that make sense and fit? Or No, it doesn't make sense at all. No Jew would invent that story. Um, no Jew would invent the story of um, a, a Messiah that gets defeated, that gets killed, and there would certainly be no need for them to rise from the dead. And if they did rise from the dead, then they'd come with their sword and they'd to defeat their enemies. Uh, and they, they wouldn't be uh, just an ordinary person, an ordinary Joe cooking breakfast by the side of the lake, or an ordinary person just walking along the street along with, uh, in the dust with everyone else. They'd be a, a wonderful um, resurrected super being. That's just the resurrection is not a story that could be invented by Jews. Do, do you, um, uh, just a, a quick, so I remember when I reached out to you, I, I was sort of studying the Apostle Paul and his appearance, and I, I was trying to kind of look at the angle of, well, forget about the mechanism, Let, let's pretend it's a, you, let's just say it's a hallucination or something like that, but I was trying to argue that, well, it couldn't be for the very reason that you're giving here, because it just wouldn't make sense uh, from the Jewish perspective, a, a crucified Messiah, uh, rising from the dead before the general resurrection, that sort of thing. So it, it that would be sort of like an indicator that it required some kind of supernatural confirmation to to push him over the edge and say, yes, this isn't just a, vis a false vision from Satan or something. This is actually true. Um, yeah, I don't know. Did, what what do you make of maybe providing some kind of evidence for the resurrection? based on the fact that even if Paul did have a hallucination, that wouldn't be adequate because it wouldn't fit his prior beliefs or something. Paul didn't just have the problem of um, having to take on a belief which was completely alien to Judaism at the time. He also had the problem of trying to convince Gentiles of this. And that, that's, that's, I, that's kind of a stupidly impossible task. Uh, they, they had no concept of resurrection of the dead. There was this saying, you know, once the blood is in the sand, the the the, 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 the no person doesn't rise. It's uh, it was it's like trying to sell a snake oil. It, it would be immediately grasped as uh, evidence that this new religion is just one of those Eastern religions which is forever corrupting our society. It would send it nowhere. And the the idea that Paul is then having to have that as a core of his of his teaching I, that must have been such a constraint on him so it was made it so difficult for him to preach yeah i i, I agree as well it, it's just so shocking uh within that context there so it's all right cool um it, it would so, have been okay if paul had changed it somewhat so that you know when jesus rose he was like a god and uh, he sort of was in the air and people worshipped him uh, and so, you know, he he wouldn't have he, he wouldn't say that he met 500 people. Of course, you know, they might see him uh, in his glory. But uh, to have him as a human being after rising from the dead, that's that's just hope. All right. Um, so, so, yeah, now I'm going to go to question five. And this is this is a big baby. Uh, so I, I do want. Yeah, we can spend some time on this one. This this is the subject of one of your most recent books on the issue of morals and that. But uh, I've gotten a lot of feedback from listeners on, on this question, even even some Christians um, will, will use this and they'll say, well, well, look, there are certain Old Testament commands that we have, um, right? You know, the, for example, we have the death penalty, we have circumcision, we have, um, you know, fo following, following the law, and it's very strict. Um, even at the time of Jesus, a, a lot of the, the Pharisees, for example, were really strict. You, you've got to follow these commands. But we find out in the New Testament, we as Christians, we, we don't follow that. We don't have to get circumcised. We don't have to follow the, the food laws or, or we don't stone people to death if they commit adultery and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I want to focus on this this question. Like, why, why is it Christians um, don't follow the commands? Are, are we making mistakes? Should we be following this? How, how do we understand the, the, 
Old Testament commands and laws uh, as Christians, uh, where it's not a contradiction, where we're just not contradicting it. Well, of course, Christians did circumcise themselves if they were Jews. Um, and I think it's very significant that we have in Luke that Jesus was circumcised. Uh, the, the church was never against circumcision, and uh, Paul wasn't against circumcision. He was only against people saying, you have to be circumcised, you have to become a Jew in order to then get upgraded to being Christian. And no, the, the, Jesus wasn't against circumcision, it, it just isn't necessary. And, and just to follow up, but would you say that that's the same for it's not necessary for Jews today, like do you, Jewish con, um, like if, if you're uh, born to a Jewish Christian family, like they don't need to be circumcised or? Well, I'm not going to tell a Jew how to be a Jew. <laughs> OK, OK, <laughs> um, fair enough. Um, OK. And, and what about the, the food laws or, or something like that, like how are Christians supposed to make sense of that? Is that sort of similar to the circumcision thing? It's it's just for Jews or Jewish Christians, I should say. Yeah. Uh, there again, Jesus didn't. Um, no, he wasn't against the food laws. And uh, as far as we can see, he kept the food laws. Uh, there might have been a, uh, a little bit of a balani about uh, how much that food they got on the Sabbath when the disciples were rubbing the corn for themselves. You're allowed to eat a, a snack that hasn't um, it, that, that, that you grind yourself on the Sabbath, as long as it's only a snack. But of course, um, you have um, uh, some untithed. If you have untithed food there, you can't eat the heave offering elements. That's the one hundredth part, not the tenth. It's the tenth of the tenth, and you can't eat that. And if you eat that, the um, heave offering part, that's deadly, and you can't tithe it on the Sabbath because that's work. So <laughs> you're sort of caught there. And mm -hmm. um, that, that, that's why Jesus compares it to eating the uh, Sabbath day, uh, eat, eating the, the showbread uh, by David, because that was heave offering too. You can't eat something that's only for the priests. So, but uh, that wasn't Jesus. He, he it seemed, it very carefully says it was disciples who were doing that and Jesus wasn't. And it looks like the gospels are being very careful to show that Jesus did actually keep the food laws. Gotcha, interesting, okay. But, um, but of course, in, in, in Mark 7, you also, in Mark 7, you also have this very long debate about whether you need to do the washing and whether the food laws are necessary or not. And Jesus clearly says, no, they're not necessary. Interesting. All right. Uh, and one last the one last thing that I think is important before I kind of ask my general follow ups. But OK, um, well, what about, uh, you know, the, there are punishments that are prescribed or attached to the moral law. You know, if, if someone commits adultery, we stone them to death. Why, why aren't Christians expected to do that today? With, with punishments, it's uh, very different. Um, the punishments don't stay the same throughout the Bible. So at different times, um, the same thing might be wrong, but it's treated within a different way. Uh, obviously, in Mosaic society, when you're living in tents, you can't put someone in prison because they just uh, cut their way out of the tent or well, they bite their way out of the tent. Even you know, yeah. you, you, there aren't any prisons. You can't imprison people. So pretty much everything has a death penalty. Uh, and that, that by the time of Jesus, there just isn't a death penalty. It's not just that the Romans have stopped Jews from carrying out death penalty. They, they didn't seem to like it anyway. Mm. So when they charged Jesus with being um, a, a drunkard and a glutton, uh, that was a, um, a capital offence from Deuteronomy 21. Uh, they didn't then say, and now we're going to stone you. They just said, you know, you're guilty of that. And you have a mob that tries to stone the woman caught in adultery. But that's not part of the Jewish system. They're, they're just not carrying out death penalties anymore. And Jesus didn't say, but you should be carrying out death penalty. He, he wasn't for it either. But uh, the, that's um, an argument from silence, which is, of course, very difficult. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 interesting as well, because I've sort of encountered that there was this um, uh, change in the time of Jesus, even within rabbinic uh, Judaism, the rabbinic traditions kind of quote unquote water down the these uh punishments and they say oh, well okay instead of the death penalty you can pay a fine or something like that I, I forget the so even the rabbinic traditions um at the time of Jesus were had changed as you sort of hinted right 
Yeah, it's it's not watering down though. Oh. It, um, the the punishments are in the law. Uh, they we see them change within the Old Testament. And remember um, the lex talionis, the uh, you know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's the maximum penalty. You are allowed to ask for a fine. You are allowed to ask for money compensation instead. And uh, you know, they, yeah, I, I, there isn't um, uh, a law which has a death penalty where you can ask for a fine instead. But uh, th th this idea that punishments are not fixed is uh, fairly clear in the Old Testament. Okay, that that's interesting. I, I didn't actually know that as a Christian, so I, I'm guilty as, as charged. So the, the, the penalty, you know, the lex talionis or eye for an eye is, is inherently in the Old Testament itself a maximum uh, penalty, but it doesn't necessarily prescribe that you have to do that. It can be a lesser or a fine or something like that. Um, yeah, that, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Thank you for, for that. Um, all right. And one of my general follow-ups, uh, one of my two general follow-ups on this. Um, okay. There's also some Christians will appeal to the fact that there are uh, different types of commands or laws, right? There, there's the moral law or there's the civil law and the priestly law. And you, you have to pay attention to the context uh, of what category those laws fit into. So, you know, Christians will say, well, Jesus, Jesus didn't abolish or contradict the law. He fulfilled some of those laws. And they'll also say the moral law is, is that still applies today to some extent. So, yeah, do, do you see this kind of categorization of the laws in the Old Testament and uh, how Christians apply that today in terms of Jesus fulfilling? Um, does that work or? It, it works, but it doesn't work. Uh, clearly, the ceremonial laws, they don't apply if you're not carrying out the ceremonies and the agricultural laws that apply only to the land, to the land of Israel, which Jews didn't apply outside the land. They didn't apply in Syria or in the diaspora. They don't, uh, but they don't matter either, unless, of course, you're trying to be uh, a farmer in Israel. So, so a lot of these laws fall away anyway. But it's the moral laws are very difficult. You can't just say, ah, but we, t we keep all the moral laws, you know, because uh, then you say, oh, well, but we happen to be worshipping on the wrong day of the week or that we uh, are not keeping the, the laws about uh, who can marry who. or it's, it's very difficult saying, yes, the whole set of moral laws, they still apply. And, and I, I actually deal with this in uh, one of my latest books, uh, Moral Questions of the Bible, uh, The Timeless Truth in a Changing World, to see which rules in the Bible actually apply to us today, let alone in the New Testament. And what I do is say, well, if the law doesn't change throughout the Bible, then it's likely that's a timeless law. You know that you shouldn't steal in the Old Testament. You shouldn't steal in the New Testament. Well, it's likely you shouldn't be. A, you shouldn't steal now. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can especially be sure that it's timeless if it's against the the cultural context. Now, not stealing isn't against the cultural context in the Old Testament. Everyone says you shouldn't steal. I mean, it's not against the cultural context in the New Testament. Everyone says you shouldn't steal. So we have to think about it. But yes, not stealing uh, de definitely is something we shouldn't do. But what about how many people you can marry? You know, in the Old Testament, you can marry lots of wives. In the New Testament, you can only marry one wife. What do you do nowadays? And you say, well, actually, the context is different. You're going, you're staying with the culture in the Old Testament where lots of people can marry. And you're staying with the culture in the New Testament where you can only marry one person if you're a part of Roman society. So it looks like it's culturally specific. It's saying live with the culture and perhaps with the reasons for that as well, that lots of men died in battle in the Old Testament. And if you would only have one wife, then there's lots of people who are uh, in poverty and are unsupported. So there, you, you use arguments like this to see which rules, which commands continue. But the principle behind the command never changes. God's principles don't change. So God is in the principle, got the principle of everyone should be set in families if they want to be. So you have to have polygamy in the Old Testament and uh, monogamy in the New Testament. But God's plan is still that people should be in families if they want to be. Hmm. That's okay. So that's fascinating. So it is, uh, you have this sort of hermeneutic where it's like, yeah, if it's consistent across cultural context then it's probably a universal moral command whereas if it appears even if it's a moral command it appears cultural 
uh, specific, then it, it's not, if it's not carried through to the New Testament. Um, what, what, about, what about this, though? What, what, if, what if something is consistent, more, uh, moral law or something is consistent in the Old Testament and New Testament, um, but that's because, someone could argue, well, that's just because the, that cultural element carried over and was the same, but today the culture, cultural context is different. So even though there's a moral command in the New Testament, we don't need to follow that. Uh, could someone argue that way or? Certainly, um, it, the matter of slavery uh, in the Old Testament, uh, all, all the nations around had slaves and uh, Israel had people who owned slaves and there were laws made to um, make sure that those slaves were looked after. And in the New Testament, you still have people with slavery. Uh, the Romans had slaves, the Jews to a certain extent had slaves, and uh, they, they should still keep those laws about slavery. And the, um, the New Testament doesn't speak against the possession of slaves, but only speaks about how to treat the slaves. And then people say, well, surely then, you know, that just continues. But you have to read between the lines because the laws that are given to Israel to, as how to treat their slaves are so completely different from the laws of people outside. You have to give them food. If you injure them, they have to go free. If you kill them, it's like murdering a free person. It's, it's, it, they're such different laws. And in the New Testament, uh, Paul tells, them to, uh, tells Christians to treat a Christian slave like their brother. And you can't tell them to release them because it's illegal to release a slave before they're 30 years old. It'd be, the slave would get into trouble, the owner would get into trouble, and anyone supporting them would get into trouble. So they can't, he can't say release the slaves, but he can say treat them like a brother. And he absolutely condemns people who trade in slaves, who uh, take people into slavery. So you can see that God is pushing and pushing and pushing people against slavery so that when the church is able to do that, they can abolish slavery completely. Of course, the church didn't, but that's that's a big problem. Um, I do have one quick question because it, uh, on slavery, since you bring it up, but um, it, it's something that I've I've done shows on myself. I I, had, I used to have an atheist co-host, and we would we've debated slavery, and one of his uh, major pressing points is it, it, from an Old Testament perspective is, well, look, there there are different treatments of the slaves. So so sure. You, it, slaves within the nation of Israel or, or Jewish slaves or something were had these kind of benefits and they were treated specially but if you were an outsider if you were a prisoner of war um, he will say well the the laws treat those people as property not as human beings and yeah I, I would like you to do you want to speak to speak to that is there a double standard in the treatment and is it true that, that it's chattel slavery when when we're talking about slaves from POWs or people outside of the the land of Israel or something? Um, I don't know any laws which are different for different sorts of slaves. The, the, there's just the, the one term for slaves. If, they don't, uh, if you treat mistreat a slave, you have to let them go. And if you don't feed them, you, you, you're, you're in trouble. It's but uh, of course, uh, there, there is a difference in that um, people could enslave themselves. Uh, it's um, a, a form of borrowing money. If you've got a daughter and she needs a dowry and you don't have savings, uh, you can borrow six years wages or up to six years wages. They wouldn't allow any more. And then, of course, you work off that borrowing. So then you work for free for that person. Of course, so when you're working for free for that person, they have to feed you, they have to clothe you, they have to give you somewhere to live. But uh, it's um, a form of voluntary enslavement. But uh, both the person who does a six year voluntary enslavement or the person who gets uh, um, taken as slave in warfare, and uh, they're, they're, they have the same regulations. All right. So another overall consideration. So great. We, we've been listening to, to your um to your answers uh, overall as to how to interpret these laws, but you're forgetting it. The skeptic is probably screaming, yeah, but uh, Dr. In, um, Dr. Anselm Brewer, you're forgetting that some of these commands come with certain qualifiers, calling them olam, which in Hebrew means they're forever, or you know, the, these commands are to be in effect throughout the generations or forever and that sort of thing. So 
uh, but yet they're not. As you as you stated to us, Christians don't follow that because the the cultural context has changed or that sort of thing. So, isn't this a, a contradiction? If this command is to be forever, but yet it's not forever, um, yeah. What what do you make if someone comes back with that? If someone's going to be a Jew, they should be worshiping on the Sabbath. They should be keeping the food laws. They should be getting circumcised. That's part of being a Jew. And uh, throughout the generations, if you want to keep being a Jew, then you have to keep to those rules. That's part of Judaism. But of course, you don't have to be a Jew in order to be a Christian. Uh, you can be a Christian as a Jew, or you can be a Christian as a Gentile. Uh, personally, I prefer being a Jew, uh, being a Christian as a Gentile, so it yeah. sounds quite tough being a Jew. But as, um, there, there's also a certain uh, family uh, comfort in Judaism and uh, certainly there's the wonderful tradition of history and so uh, the tradition of the law and being the people who kept the kept the law safe for all those uh, all those hundreds of years so it's it's uh, a wonderful part of society to be in but um yeah you, know, you don't have to keep those things if you're a christian gotcha okay so so yeah so your answer is kind of they are still in effect for Jews. They are forever for Jews. Um, I'm not sure if you would that still apply to Jewish Christians as well. Well, all, all Jews have the choice of whether to keep these things or not, and Jewish Christians have the choice of whether to keep these things or not. And Paul uh, circumcised uh, uh, one of his disciples. Uh, he wasn't against circumcision. It's just a you know, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. And yeah. uh, Paul kept, um, took offerings to the temple for his uh, Nazarite vow. Uh, he valued parts of Judaism. And uh, I, there are many Christians today who continue being Jews, and that's wonderful. Interesting. All right, cool. Uh, yeah, well, um, I might throw throw this past you just to, to see your take. Because I asked my pastor this question as well, just to see what he he would say. And he, he sort of had a different thing. So he... He believes, obviously, well, the nation, the nation of Israel, that these commands, Christian, the bulk of Christians, whether Gentile and Jewish, are, are the nation of Israel now. And he was saying, when, when these commands say that they're olam or forever, it's it's talking about the underlying principle, not so much the the form. So, like when it's talking about the Sabbath, for example, being a command forever, the principle of worshiping, taking one day out to worship God, that's what would be for forever it's not necessarily worship on the sabbath the I, I guess you just wouldn't know that that's not a proper way as a rabbinic scholar to, to read these commands or do you see any merit in looking at it that way well it's it's wonderful to see yourself inheriting these commands and doing it in a sort of gentile way uh, a shadow of what the the jews did and do but um when, when i consider myself as being engrafted into the the jewish olive stock I see that as a wonderful privilege, and I, I inherit a great deal from that stock. And uh, but I don't consider myself to be as, um, as Jewish as those who have been there all the time, and or, or to have inherited everything from that stock. I, I inherit lots of good things. I inherit the Torah. I, I inherit the the, um, the knowledge of what God has done for Israel in the past. But I'm, I don't become a Jew by being in here. Uh, grafted in i'm still grafted in i get strength from that graft i don't become exactly like the, the stock gotcha perfect okay uh and one last uh follow-up to get to get your take on and this is um going back to the to the other end of the spectrum so i do have some some christian listeners um just to, to you know peter uh, if you're listening and as well arthur jeffries um who, who comes from a catholic background and they adopt kind of um, the same approach as Randall Rouser. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but they have this quote unquote love hermeneutic where, where they just, they don't even look at the, the cultural context necessarily, but they, they have this overriding thing of Jesus is about love. And if you, if there's a command against homosexuality or uh, a, you know, a command about stoning people for adultery or something, those are invalid. We can say those are not inspired because they're unloving. Um, I, I just want to throw it to you. Do, do you think this is a proper hermeneutic to approach these things or, or not? 
well, certainly, uh, if there's something that isn't loving, that should make us pause and think, well, hang on a minute. Uh, is this really part of the, the Christian tradition? Is it really what Jesus would do? But I'm very aware that when people ask themselves, what would Jesus do? They're actually asking, uh, what would a nice grandmother in suburban society do? <laughs> and the gr nice, that nice grandmother wouldn't make a whip and uh, turn over the tables and uh, physically force people out of the temple courts because he felt that they weren't respecting it. It's, Jesus isn't always nice. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> Yeah, there's uh, there's definitely an interesting dichotomy. Like everyone thinks, oh, he's uh, some kind of hippie or something like that. But no, he, he's you have to take him in full context. There's you know take him for for everything that he said. And you know, there are some things that may offend modern sensibilities, but you you can't just cut and paste that out type thing. All right. Um, yeah, I think I think we've sort of covered in ter terms of number six. We we've sort of covered these specific examples already in terms of uh, alleged examples that that anti missionary Jewish anti missionaries or, or atheists and skeptics will say these are contradictions. But um, one thing that we we haven't said. So uh, okay, well, what about uh, the sacrificial system? Um, certain Jews will say, anti-missionaries will say, look, uh, uh, that's not even necessary to, to be say, like blood is not necessary. You can uh, atone for your sins in other ways, uh, you know, through alms or good, good deeds, through repentance. Uh, you know, there, there are other means of attaining uh, atonement between man and God. So, um, yeah, what, what do you make of maybe the sacrificial system in light of, you know, Jesus, Jesus teaching, Christian teaching on that, uh, compared to rabbinic teaching and, and Jewish teaching today. Jesus didn't teach on the sacrificial system, except to say that uh, if you, if a believer is on their way to the temple to make an offering, and then remember they have something against their brother, then go and sort it out with their brother first before making the offering, which kind of assumes that people are going to keep bringing offerings to the temple. So Jesus wasn't against those offerings. And even a book like Hebrews, which is, appears to be very much against the sacrifices, it's not saying that they were wrong. It's just saying that, well, that they were uh, looking forward to something even better, but not wrong. I think we misunderstand sacrifices because we don't know how they happened. Uh, there's still a principle in Judaism that if you uh, butcher an animal for eating, and you hurt it while killing it. You know, if your knife isn't sharp enough, so it actually feels pain when you're cutting through the artery. If you hurt the animal, that animal isn't kosher. And that, that's also applied to animals sacrificed in the temple. No animal was allowed to be hurt while it was being killed. So sacrifice never involved suffering of animals. Uh, we, we tend to get mixed up over that because Jesus is a sacrifice. His death, of course, involved a lot of suffering, and we mix in that element of suffering with the sacrifice. But the sacrifice wasn't a matter of bringing harm. It was a matter of bringing food. Uh, you bring the food that you were going to eat uh, uh, for a meal to the temple, and then you leave the fat that's around the kidneys, uh, the, fa the fat in the mizzen tree, uh, for putting on the uh, altar as a sweet-smelling offering. You leave one leg for the priest to take home and eat, and then you take the rest home and eat it. And that, that was the vast majority of sacrifices. Uh, the only different one, the only ones that are significantly different are the sin offerings, and they were eaten by the priests instead of by the people who offered them. And then if the priest brought a sin offering, of course the priest couldn't eat it, so then it was burnt. But there are very few burnt offerings. Pretty much everything in the temple was food. All right, cool. Well, that that's actually kind of a good segue into the the next question, and and this is a, a big baby. This is a huge topic. There's lots we can talk about here, but uh, the notion of Jesus as the Jewish Messiah. Um, once again, you as a rabbinic scholar and, and knowing the context um, of the second temple, late second temple period when Jesus was living. Um, what uh, obviously there are lots of 
modern day Jews that will say, no, there's, it's impossible for Jesus to be the Jewish Messiah. He didn't fulfill any of the provable messianic prophecies. He's, you know, his, his mission, as um, described fully in the New Testament, fully fleshed out. So it's, it doesn't necessarily have to go back to the historical Jesus. But the, the Christian Jesus as a whole is just, they'll say he's contradictory. Uh, he doesn't fulfill the provable messianic prophecies and the prophecies that Christians point to to say, you know, like Isaiah 53 or Daniel 9 or, or you know, the Psalms, anything like that, those aren't really messianic prophecies. So, yeah, j- just uh, to start off in general, what, what's your take on, on Jesus fitting the Jewish uh, me- Messiah, prof- messianic prophecies, uh, and contrast that with the expectations of the Jews at, at the time of Jesus? Well, certainly he doesn't uh, fulfill those prophecies that uh, uh, that he's going to rule over the earth and he's going to defeat the enemies. And uh, and uh, we believe that he will do that in the future. And I think Zechariah's vision is uh, very pertinent so that then people will see him and recognize him for who he is and uh, and mourn for the one that they've pierced. And that's, uh, that, that's fair enough that you take it like that. But it's not quite so that Jews weren't expecting a suffering Messiah. Uh, when you look in the um, uh, the Targum of Isaiah, uh, the, that, that's uh, one of the earliest Targums, and certainly the, the first edition of that Targum would have been around uh, before 70. Uh, Bruce Chilton, in his introduction to the uh, McNamara uh, Targums, uh, he says he gives the evidence very clearly there. And uh, th- that that is talking about uh, the suffering servant as being the Messiah. Now later, of course, Jews said, oh, hang on a minute. No, 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 no. It's not talking about a person, uh, let alone Jesus. Uh, it's, it's talking about the nation. And then the interpretation went on to be that the suffering servant was the nation. But that, that that's not what you find in the Targum. And uh, you, you have to take that Targum as being an early tradition because no one would put it there later anyway. Uh, it's certainly the evidence for it being early. So that they, they did have some expectation of a suffering Messiah in the first century. But now, of course, they don't. With with the Isaiah 53, you, you mentioned the national interpretation. Um, once again, that, that's something I've, I've heard when I've debated the Messianic prophecies. Um, there is another, what what do you make, there's an interpretation where they say it's, it's not so much the nation, but it's a right, it's talking about the righteous remnant within the nation. Uh, does that, do you think that would fare any better um, compared to the national interpretation that came later on? Or Well, it would make more sense in that uh, the nation of Israel were never quite pure, uh, never reached that state. So, uh, yeah, it would make more sense. But the, the point is uh, that that is not the interpretation that's given in Targum Messiah. And you can't imagine that personal suffering Messiah being a later interpretation in Targum Messiah. It's not something that was added later. And it uh, almost certainly was part of that first edition of the Targum. Okay. Um, what and what about so Daniel nine is another famous one that it relates to the timing of the the Messiah. Um, so yeah, what what do you make of what are Christians to make of this? Is Jesus um, a fulfillment of this? Can we get specific? Does, does it actually predict? Uh, I've seen some some Christians try to argue down to the very year that that Jesus uh, came and crucified, depending on when you you know, 30 or 33 AD. Um, and also, what what did the rabbinics make uh, on the timing of, of Jesus? Is, is In terms of the, tra- the traditional Christian understanding of this Messianic prophecy, is that in sync with rabbinic interpretations of the timing of the Messiah? Um, yeah, I'll turn it to you for that. I, I'm afraid I don't know any Jewish traditions talking about the timing of the Messiah based on Daniel 9. I, I, I know lots of Christians have gone into it. I, when I was a teenager, I got the calendars out and did the got the maths out and uh, did the calculations myself and it's uh, very impressive uh, and uh, yeah it's it, it's a wonderful prophecy but I don't think that it was referred to uh, in the early days doesn't um, at least in general doesn't Josephus uh, say that we were expecting the Messiah to come in the days of the Roman Empire before the second temple was destroyed or am I am I just off base there uh, I'm, I'm not sure which passage you're referring to, but of course, uh, everyone is always expecting Jesus to appear in their li- own lifetime. That's why you don't go to the cinema on Sunday, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> okay. 
Fair, fair enough. Um, yeah, I, I know. Uh, I, I'm just remembering. I, I wish I had the passage for you, but Michael Brown, Dr. Michael Brown, he kind of talks about uh, some something about the traditions. But yeah, I, I don't know offhand the the ones that I'm uh, talking about. So, all right. Um, yeah, fair enough. Um, okay. Well, what about what about the fact that Jesus, rather than looking at it positively. Um, Jesus is, is said, and we sort of hinted that he he contradicts the Jewish expectation. He's not the ruler, the visible ruler over all the earth. Um, we kind of hinted that again. He's a a crucified Messiah, so this invalidates him. Uh, we we haven't even gotten in, gotten into the fact of the incarnation. I mean, to, uh, from a Jewish Second Temple period Jewish perspective, these guys are really strict monotheists in. in what we, you know, how, how can we make sense of the Christian doctrine of the Trinity or the Incarnation? Isn't this a blatant contradiction of what Jews would believe? Uh, right, there's, there's two things there. It, is he contradicting the um, prophecies of the Messiah ruling and is he contradicting monotheism? Uh, on uh, the Messiah ruling, of course, Jesus does imply that he will. He, he says about the, the thrones and, you know, are you able to sit on the throne uh, with me? Are you able to drink this cup? And uh, the, when the the uh, two brothers, they want to sit either side of him and rule. Jesus assumes that, yes, there will be a time of ruling. And of course, he sees it already starting with Satan falling like uh, lightning. And uh, yeah, the, the, the defeat is already starting. So the, the, there is a concept of the Messiah's ruling in Jesus' teaching. It's just not yet. This, the, let's do first things first. But uh, on um, monotheism, uh, the Jews in the first century were not as as monotheistic as we um, as we are. Um, they had a concept of Shekinah, that's the um, manifestation of God that uh, comes uh, and comes to people. They had a concept of the Holy Spirit, which is inside people. Uh, they had a concept of the Batkol, the, the voice, uh, the um, uh, the the daughter of a voice, uh, the the echo of God in the temple. So you could hear God speaking sometimes in the temple, but it wasn't God. It was a, a, an echo of him. And uh, even in the Dead Sea Scrolls, you have concept of the son of God. And, and sometimes in the Old Testament, you have that uh, God appears as an angel. So th it's, it's, it's a bit fuzzy, this idea of monotheism. And it's the Christian theologians that have made it very much more concrete. Uh, and of course, Jewish theologians have as well now that uh, that there is only one manifestation of God, and uh, that's the Father in heaven. But that, that wasn't so in the first century. Yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, I'm not sure what you'd. Um, wh what would you make? So, like, one thing is, for, yeah, they they can see God as sort of a complex unity. It's not necessarily an absolute unity. That sort of came came about later, right? You see that in in. Is the in the Islamic understanding of God, and they're sort of wrestling with the inherent inherent nature. But what I wanted to ask you about is, I kind of like uh, Richard Bauckham's notion of divine identity, and you know, at, at, in the biblical period, in this the late Second Temple period, and and when the Gospels and that are being written, their their emphasis is who God is, um, rather than the internal philosophical nature of what God is, and you know, he has this notion of, of who God is in terms of, well, he, he's the creator and sustainer. He, he has this, uh, and he's also the, the sovereign ruler over all of creation. And this is what defines who God is. And they're saying, well, Richard Bauckham's argument is, well, Jesus shares in that divine identity, those identifying features. But yeah, I want to turn it to you. Do you find that a helpful way of understanding or... Do you, yeah, what do you make of that notion? Yeah, that, that's a very nice way of putting it. Uh, and uh, thank you for telling me about that. Uh, it, often God is described as the God who creates all, the, the, the God of all the earth. That, and so, uh, they have to say that, of course, because in the um, biblical world, there are so many other competing gods. Uh, we're very used to the idea of there being only one God and uh, having only one form. And so for us, Trinity is kind of more problematic than it would be for a first century Jew. Of course, uh, second century, third century is rather different. But uh, yeah, there, there, there were, it, it, things were not 
so settled. Uh, people weren't used to telling God what he should be like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a good lesson for some of us today, I think. So, um, all right, cool. Um, yeah, go, going back, uh, another generalized question, going back to the Messianic prophecies specifically. Um, so one thing I, I hear about a lot um, if I if I speak about Messianic prophecies is skeptics will point out to, well, look, Ma Matthew, it's obviously complete bunk. I mean, Matthew says this is, a, you know, Jesus going down into Egypt or something like that. This is allegedly a fulfilled Messianic prophecy, but this it's no such thing. It, the Old Testament doesn't prophesy these specific details. So it, uh, it, it kind of gets into the distinction between messianic prophecies versus messianic typologies, and I was wondering if you wanted to speak to sort of that that distinction, or or are, in your opinion, are the skeptics right? Is is that a contradiction? And Matthew's just messing up there. Um, and the final bit is, you as a rabbinic scholar, how, did um, did the Jewish scholars of the day of Jesus interpret? you know, messianic prophecies or typologies in a similar way uh, to what we find in the New Testament. Well, certainly at Qumran, you can see that sort of thing. They're taking tiny little details and regarding those as prophecies in the same sort of way as you find in the New Testament, but uh, much more exaggerated. And um, for Math Matthew 1 and 2 is, is a bit of a special case. It's, um, it's the story of Balaam, uh, which is uh, being... Um, was popular in the synagogues, and the Matthew is going through in detail. I, I'll refer you to a paper I wrote on it, uh, going through the prophecies there. But uh, yeah, I, I, in general, uh, the, the New Testament prophecies are grabbing things from the Old Testament, which didn't mean that necessarily in context. But hey, hang on a minute. When we look at Jesus, these are fulfilled there. So you, you sort of say to yourself, well, prophecies do have more than one meaning, and they have these hidden meanings which can point to Christ. And so that, that's what's happening with the Messianic prophecies as well. So you can't really complain about it. But the point is, you can't use the Old Testament to predict what is going to happen. You can only use the, the Old Testament to say, aha, now I understand what's happened. Rather, rather like Jesus did in Luke 24, you know, pointing to the Old Testament saying, look, these things must have happened. But how can you predict it? You look at Psalm 22, and it seems to be uh, almost like a, a circus full of animals attacking Jesus or attacking the person who's being killed. And uh, then they're dying of thirst and uh, it, uh, and having uh, all these bulls and uh, dogs and uh, things looking at him and uh, attacking him, presumably. If you were going to predict from the text what was going to happen to Jesus, you would never work out it was a crucifixion. But then when you look at the crucifixion and you look at Psalm 22, oh, these things match up. And then the animals are metaphors. But you can't say ahead of time what are going to be metaphors and what's going to be literal. You can't say ahead of time whether the thirst was going to be literal or metaphor or whether the bulls are going to be literal or metaphor. Just sort of following up on that, because I've heard a lot um, of skepticism towards Matthew. And they'll say he's the worst. He, he's just totally uh un-jewish be because a lot in part because of these kinds of factors and and from what i've heard from from the scholarship it's it's the opposite he's he's very much uh following in that milieu um and using that style rabbinic quote-unquote rabbinic style or or you know the the pharisee of, of the style of jews in that day so it, yeah, did, would you confirm that, um, that, yeah, Matt, Matthew is highly Jewish uh, for that time, in that time? Yeah, uh, it, Matthew makes much more sense reading it uh, through the eyes of rabbinic literature than it does reading it through the eyes of Greek literature, which just makes it uh, very obscure. And there's so many obscure sayings in Matthew. Yeah, any um, specific examples, like comparative examples you'd like to point out just to illustrate that or yeah it, when you see Matthew and Luke to a certain extent you, you've got all these little gobbits of teaching rather than um, a, a long extended passage like you have in John and the, the, this, this it does make it does remind me of the way in which um, Jews memorized their uh, master's teaching as a small summary which could be memorized and uh, then then would be the teaching 
rather than memorizing a whole speech. So it, it, the Sermon on the Mount has lots of these little bits and pieces, which each of which are a summary of a wonderful message. And also the, the Lord's Prayer, it, it's so similar to the prayers which were taught by rabbis to their disciples. Uh, they, they call them, uh, well, the, the, they are um, abbreviations of the 18 benedictions. You know, that's the long prayer that you say when you in the morning and in the evening and so uh, once more on the Sabbath. And it's um, when you're in a hurry, you still have to say the 18 benedictions, but you don't have time. So you, you say uh, a short version of it. And the short version that's taught by Eliezer ben Hakanus and um, uh, uh, other rabbis look very similar to what we have in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, you know, even phrases like um, uh, be done in heaven as it is on earth or um, the, 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 um, uh, um, the, the phrase about uh, giving us the food. Though, of course, in the 18 benedictions, you're not asking for daily food. You're asking for God to fill the barns for the whole year, uh, as you do it with a normal agricultural cycle. Uh, whereas Jesus, he wasn't a farmer who had a yearly cycle. He was um, a, an itinerant beggar who had only a daily cycle. But the, the, the phrases, uh, you know, um, our, our Father in heaven and your will be done are, are phrases which you have in those summaries of the 18 benedictions. So when Jesus, when they say, uh, to teach us how to pray, Jesus says, do it like this. Uh, he's teaching them how to say a prayer quickly which incorporates everything that's important. Uh, yeah, you, it reminds me also even even of, of Paul, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, he, for I delivered which I received, which is a, a, a special phrase that Pharisees use for passing on tradition and that. So, you know, these, kind, these kinds of examples are, are all over the place in, in the New Testament. Um, all right, cool. Um, all right, yeah, so... There's, there's different forms of memorization in halakhic traditions. Uh, that's to do with laws, uh, the memorization would have to be word perfect. In a Gallic memorization, it's not word perfect. The ideas have to be there, the vocabulary has to be there, but it doesn't have to be this word, this, then comes this word, then comes this word. And in prayers, there mustn't be that perf perfection. Um, Eliezer ben Hakana said that if you pray exactly the same as uh, what you've learned, or exactly the same as what you've prayed before, uh, then you're you're just being hypocritical. You're just saying you're just saying the words. So you have to put in some variety. So the, the variety you have between Luke and Matthew is uh, actually we've got three versions of Eliezer's uh, prophecy of the eighteen benedictions, and they have the same sort of variations as uh, Luke and Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer. It's um yeah uh, you, you can put them up to, next to each other, and you you have a hard time working out which one comes from the New Testament. Yeah, yeah, deja vu or something. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. Um, yeah, so so I think the the last topic I, I wanted to get into uh, with you. It's so I, I I'm uh, familiar with Chris Date. I, I sort of debated Chris Date on the nature of hell. Uh, Chris Date's an, an annihilationist. Just for for those who aren't familiar in the audience, um, but I was interested because you attended his his rethinking uh, conference there, and you you sort of gave. A presentation about the, the nature of the afterlife and hell um, from a rabbinic perspective and how that kind of relates to uh, the New Testament teachings of, about the afterlife so yeah did, did you want to maybe share share some of that how, how, what is the the teaching on the afterlife um, ha, has that teaching evolved from the earliest Old Testament days up until the New Testament days and how does that relate to uh, rabbinical teachings about the afterlife? Yeah, in the Gospels, you have a mixture of teaching about um, Jesus saying that uh, hell is a place where you're punished, but uh, also it's a place where you are destroyed. And in the epistles, of course, uh, there's a lot more about destruction uh, than there is about punishment. But some people seem to take one group of verses and say, ah, uh, there's going to be punishment in hell, and another people say, oh no, 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 I, I believe in these verses here, which say there's going to be destruction mm -hmm. in hell. Mm -hmm. But th there's no need to pick the bits that you're going to believe from the Bible. Uh, it, the, uh, both of those elements already existed in Jewish belief about hell, 
that there was going to be punishment followed by destruction. And I see no reason why the New Testament isn't mirroring that. Okay. Um, all right. Cool. And what about uh, so? So some people, skeptics, ha have argued that in the earliest days of the Old Testament, there, there just was no concept of the afterlife. It, you know, it was more earth centered Let's have babies, and how many kids am I going to have? And that's the focus. But they they didn't seem to care about the afterlife. Whereas in the New Testament period, that this is obviously the essential message you know get, getting having eternal life versus eternal death and that sort of thing so they, they say there's this evolution uh of the doctrines um i don't know if you you know anything about that or um, i i find that extraordinary to think that people in the old testament weren't considering the afterlife mm -hmm. when israel uh, came be, to be a nation in egypt mm -hmm. where they were crazily mad about what they were going to do as soon as they stepped over that threshold and uh, how they were going to live in the afterlife and uh, all the nations around had these stories about things that happened in the afterlife and you, you have these hints in the Old Testament at least about people thinking about what's going to happen they're thinking more about what's going to happen in this life but it, it's not they're not against the idea that there's an afterlife mm -hmm. it's just such a commonplace why bother to say it it's yes yeah. This is there. It's 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 just automatically implied, I guess, kind of thing. Everyone knew it, so yeah, why well, highlight it? Okay, all right, cool. Uh, it's like asking, um, what's the definition of marriage in the Old Testament? Duh, there isn't one because everyone knew about marriage, and there's no need to say what it is because everyone accepts it. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Um, okay, yeah, yeah, I think. Um, Okay, well, yeah, we could do this angle. Well, what about the morality of, of hell? So, um, do, do you have anything to say about that? Like, some obviously skeptics and that will debate and, and say, look, wh whatever the Jewish teaching of, of hell was, that that it's so immoral to punish people for for what just not believing in in Jesus or you know a finite amount of sins. Um, you, you kind of answered that already. You, so you, your view of hell, just to clarify, is that there's going to be a period, a, a finite period of, of suffering, uh, and then you're annihilated? Or are you saying that that was the rabbinic view at the time? Uh, that was the rabbinic view at the time. Okay. Uh, I see no problem with it. Uh, you certainly can't put it the other way around, that you get annihilated and then... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, if, if you're going to accept the whole of the New Testament, the teaching of, that says you have... Um, destruction and the teaching that says you have punishment, you've got to say it's punishment followed by destruction. And uh, I, I see no problem with it being proportionate to sins. Uh, in Jesus' parable about the servants who start drinking their um, master's wine cellar while he's out and then he comes back and he says that those who um, sin lots will get many stripes, those who sin less will get few stripes. Mm -hmm. There is that concept of proportional punishment in Jesus' teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, the, so I, I see no reason why we are saying that hell is eternal punishment, except for that one verse in Matthew 23, which says that uh, um, you, uh, some go to eternal life and some go to eternal punishment. Mm -hmm. But the word that's used there is used in intertestamental Greek, you know, in, in Jewish Greek, to mean both a destruction and being punished, um, you know, be, being tortured. Uh, it, so it's, it's not that um, the uh, it's talking about a, a torture which goes on forever. It's a punishment which is eternal. You don't get out of it. You don't escape from it. Uh, you, you, it is done, finished, and uh, there's there's no escape for eternity. Gotcha. Interesting. All right. Cool. Yeah. That was that was good. Getting your take on that. Um, I, I, this is kind of a outside the thing. It's more of a theological question, so it's not asking you as a scholar. But I am just sort of curious. Um, what do you make? Uh, so I was asked. I um, I had uh, David Smalley on my show, and I, I just realized he asked me to ask you a specific question that I forgot about. So I'll ask that afterwards. But um, uh, the the morality of of hell, the conditions for eternal life. Um, what what do you make of that? Why why do you think it's necessary for 
you know, we have to repent of our sins and place our faith in Christ. Why, why can't God just forgive and forget and, and give people eternal life? Uh, human beings seem to do that. So uh, who, who is it that wants to go to heaven that um, doesn't want to repent? Oh, uh, there's a, uh, an atheist uh, from Dogma Debates named David Smalley. Um, but he, he gave me a couple questions just to, to ask you what... Um, but yeah, I, I just wanted to ask you that. It's kind of a theological question about... Yeah, uh, I, I'm thinking that uh, this sounds like a nonsense thing, but you want to go to heaven, you want to spend your time with God, but you don't want to say sorry. Yeah. That, is that representing him accurately? It's it's more about, yeah, like placing... Why is it necessary to place your faith in Christ? Like Why why is having the right beliefs necessary to get, to get a, eternal life? Oh, absolutely it isn't. Absolutely it isn't. We are not saved by believing things. No, we're, we're saved by trusting Jesus. We're, we're not <laughs> saved by um, having the, the right statement of faith at all. <laughs> there, there, there's nothing in Scripture about that. Oh, there, yes, it, there is. In Hebrews uh, 11, it says what you have to believe. Uh, in order to please God, it says Hebrews 11, 6, you have to believe that he exists and that he rewards those who uh, sincerely uh, search for him. Gotcha. All right, and and here's so here's the question that uh, the the atheist David Smalley specifically uh, when I when I mentioned you were coming on the show, he's like, please ask this to uh, to David and Stone Brewer for me. And uh, so we we kind of covered Jesus mythicism above, um, but he wants to know what what's your position on Moses as a historical figure because he he's finding that he he's saying that a lot of rabbinical scholars that he knows are coming out and saying, yeah, Moses was a pure myth, he wasn't a historical figure, so he, he wanted me to ask you your take on that. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, Mo Moses was a, an Egyptian name. Uh, we know that from um, uh, law records, uh, where there was a particular person called Moses who was uh, disputing with uh, the priestly class about uh, a field that they'd... Um, decided they owned and actually as part of his inheritance. So we have the law records for that. So it, it wasn't a Jewish name. It wasn't the sort of name that uh, a Jew would invent for their founding father. Uh, but Moses wasn't portrayed as a great hero. So he's portrayed as someone who um, couldn't speak very well and uh, made other mess ups and then went and married a black woman and his sister uh, would wants to throw him out the family for doing that. And it, 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 it's, he's not seen as a heroic person. He isn't even allowed into the promised land because he didn't obey God properly, the striking of the rock. It's not the stories we would make up about the founding father of a nation. We would say, oh yes, he did everything right and everyone one thought, thought he was wonderful and they followed him implicitly. And uh, yeah, so it's, in other words, it, maybe we can't defend Moses as a historical person by things outside the Bible, but there's no way that if it was a made-up story, they would make up those things. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, so, so what you're doing is sort of applying two historical criteria for, for identifying facts. Number one, there's the criterion of dissimilarity with Moses' uh, name. No, no Jew uh, would name their kid that. It's an Egyptian name. Uh, and then there's the criterion of embarrassment. There, there's certain embarrassing details, and those tend to be historical. So, so yeah, your your position is Moses is probably a, a historical figure in your view. Um, if if it wasn't Moses, there had to be someone who um, managed to unite the people and managed to um, get the laws together and managed to uh, encourage the people to get out of their position of slavery and actually walk out of the place and. Uh, if he didn't exist, you'd probably have to invent him, and why not call him Moses? <laughs> but you wouldn't also invent all those other horrible things about him. Gotcha. All right. Per perfect. Uh, so yeah. Uh, so there you go, D uh, David Smalley. That that was for you. I kept my promise there to you uh, from when you were on my my show last week. There. Um, so yeah. Uh, I, that's it for for my list of questions um, that I think we've covered for this round. Is there? I want to turn it to you. You're you're my guest, and I want to make sure you you get out your full case. Are, are there any topics or uh, things of discussion that I I've missed that you think would be important to talk about uh, on this issue of? Well, I'd just like to mention the book I've written. Absolutely. <laughs> yep. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, 
that's a criterion of embarrassment that I, I used for Moses just now. Uh, I've done that for Jesus as well in the Jesus scandals. And, uh, when you look at the photograph on Amazon, uh, it, it, you'll think, ah, it's a Dan, Dan Brown book, and it's all about, <laughs> about denigrating Jesus. It really isn't. I deliberately made the book look like that so that it would get into public libraries. You sly and devil. <laughs> And, and, and it worked. It's got into the public libraries, oh, and nice. Christians on the whole have thought, oh, Jesus scandals, that can't be anything that's nice. <laughs> and it isn't. It's dealing with all those embarrassing things in the Gospels, like the fact he's born of a virgin, which would have really put people off. Or, or that uh, he, he was a bachelor, which is utterly un-Jewish, and why he needs to be a bachelor. Or the, the, the way in which he... Um, broke up all the wonderful worship at Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and the fact that he rose from the dead which is really embarrassing to Jews all these things which you wouldn't write unless you had to write them and so that together they add up to pretty much everything we know about Jesus that these are things that you wouldn't want to invent about Jesus uh, but nevertheless they're in the Gospels because they have to be awesome awesome perfect yeah well Thank you so much for, for being willing to come on. I know I was really excited to, to have you on. Um, ho hopefully you had a, a good time on your, your, your end there. I wasn't too bad of a host. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been good talking to you. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And, and you're welcome back uh, anytime. I, um, out of curiosity, I'll just ask you if, if um, you did want to come back on the show, are, are there any specific uh, topics that you'd, you'd like to discuss or, or maybe I could... Uh, organize a, a discussion with uh, another eight, someone from a different perspective sometime or whatever but yeah is there anything specific you'd like me to keep in mind for, for you topics wise well Lexham is just about to bring out a book of mine on science and the bible okay uh, that uh, doesn't take science as um, uh, the hero or the bible as a hero and takes neither of those as the, the villain says uh, let's take both of them and see how they can lead towards each other awesome yeah i i can definitely uh i would definitely uh, bring you on for that topic and if you want a discussion partner i i can think of a few that would be interested in discussing that so cool yeah th thank you so much again for for being on the show um i appreciate that uh just for the audience what i have coming up next week is a discussion it's a follow-up discussion to a, a debate on the moral argument and it's going to be with uh, me and um, Val. Uh, people will, will know Val, the, the atheist there. So we're going to be looking at moral ontology and, and debating things like metaethics, the, the difference between moral truths versus non-moral truths. Uh, you know, God is the grounding for for, uh, for these necessary moral truths. So, yeah, uh, look forward to that coming out next week. Um, and, yeah, ha have a great week, everybody. All right, take care, David. Okay, great to, great to have that talk with you. All right.